The Efficacy of Prayer by C.S. Lewis from the world's Last Night and Other Essays. Some years ago, I got up one morning intending to have my hair cut in preparation for a visit to London, and the first letter I opened made it clear I need not go to London, so I decided to put the haircut off too. But then there began the most unaccountable little nagging in my mind, almost like a voice saying, Get it cut all the same. Go and get it cut. In the end I could stand it no longer. I went. Now my barber at that time was a fellow Christian, and a man of many troubles whom my brother and I had sometimes been able to help. The moment I opened his shop door he said, Oh, I was praying you might come today. And in fact, if I had come a day or so later, I should have been of no use to him. It awed me. It awes me still. But of course, one cannot rigorously prove a causal connection between the barber's prayers and my visit. It might be telepathy. It might be accident. I have stood by the bedside of a woman whose thigh bone was eaten through with cancer and who had thriving colonies of the disease in many other bones as well. It took three people to move her in bed. The doctors predicted a few months of life, the nurses, who often know better, a few weeks. A good man laid his hands on her and prayed. A year later the patient was walking, uphill too, through rough woodland, and the man who took the last X-ray photos was saying, these bones are as solid as rock. It's miraculous. But once again, there is no rigorous proof. Medicine, as all true doctors admit, is not an exact science. We need not invoke the supernatural to explain the falsification of its prophecies. You need not, unless you choose, believe in a causal connection between the prayers and the recovery. The question then arises, what sort of evidence would prove the efficacy of prayer? The thing we pray for may happen, but how can you ever know it was not going to happen anyway? Even if the thing were indisputably miraculous, it would not follow that the miracle had occurred because of your prayers. The answer surely is that a compulsive, empirical proof, such as we have in the sciences, can never be attained. Some things are proved by the unbroken uniformity of our experiences. The law of gravitation is established by the fact that, in our experience, all bodies without exception obey it. Now even if all the things that people prayed for happened, which they do not, this would not prove what Christians mean by the efficacy of prayer. For prayer is a request, the essence of request as distinct from compulsion, is that it may or may not be granted. And if an infinitely wise being listens to the requests of finite and foolish creatures, of course he will sometimes grant and sometimes refuse them. Invariable success in prayer would not prove the Christian doctrine at all. It would prove something much more like magic, a power in certain human beings to control or compel the course of nature. There are no doubt passages in the New Testament which may seem at first sight to promise an invariable granting of our prayers, but that cannot be what they really mean, for in the very heart of the story we meet a glaring instance to the contrary. In Gethsemane, the holiest of all petitioners prayed three times that a certain cup might pass from him. It did not. After that, the idea that prayer is recommended to us as a sort of infallible gimmick may be dismissed. Other things are proved not simply by experience, but by those artificially contrived experiences which we call experiments. Could this be done about prayer? I will pass over the objection that no Christian could take part in such a project, because he has been forbidden it. You must not try experiments on God, your master. Forbidden or not, is the thing even possible? I have seen it suggested that a team of people, the more the better, should agree to pray as hard as they knew how. 
over a period of six weeks for all the patients in Hospital A and none of those in Hospital B. Then you would tot up the results and see if A had more cures and fewer deaths. And I suppose you would repeat the experiment at various times and places so as to eliminate the influence of the irrelevant factors. The trouble is that I do not see how any real prayer could go on under such conditions. Words without thoughts never to heaven go, says the king in Hamlet. Simply to say prayers is not to pray. Otherwise, a team of properly trained parrots would serve as well as men for our experiment. You cannot pray for the recovery of the sick unless the end you have in view is their recovery. But you can have no motive for desiring the recovery of all the patients in one hospital and none of those in another. You are not doing it in order that suffering should be relieved. You are doing it to find out what happens. The real purpose and the nominal purpose of your prayers are at variance. In other words, whatever your tongue and teeth and knees may do, you are not praying. The experiment demands an impossibility. Empirical proof and disproof are, then, unobtainable. But this conclusion will seem less depressing if we remember that prayer is a request and compare it with other specimens of the same thing. We make requests of our fellow creatures as well as of God. We ask for the salt. We ask for a raise in pay. We ask a friend to feed the cat while we are on our holidays. We ask a woman to marry us. Sometimes we get what we ask for and sometimes not. But when we do, it is not nearly so easy as one might suppose. To prove with scientific certainty a causal connection between the asking and the getting. Your neighbor may be a humane person who would not have let your cat starve, even if you had forgotten to make any arrangement. Your employer is never so likely to grant your request for a raise as when he is aware that you could get better money from a rival firm and is quite possibly intending to secure you a raise in any case. As for the lady who consents to marry you, are you sure she had not decided to do so already? Your proposal, you know, might have been the result, not the cause, of her decision. A certain important conversation might never have taken place unless she had intended that it should. Thus, in some measure, the same doubt that hangs about the causal efficacy of our prayers to God hangs also about our prayers to man. Whatever we get, we might have been going to get anyway, but only, as I say, in some measure. Our friend, boss, and wife may tell us that they acted because we asked, and we may know them so well as to feel sure, first, that they are saying what they believe to be true, and secondly, that they understand their own motives well enough to be right. But notice that when this happens, our assurance has not been gained by the methods of science. We do not try the control experiment of refusing the raise or breaking off the engagement and then making our request again under fresh conditions. Our assurance is quite different in kind from scientific knowledge. It is born out of our personal relation to the other parties, not from knowing things about them, but from knowing them. Our assurance, if we reach an assurance, that God always hears and sometimes grants our prayers, and that apparent grantings are not merely fortuitous, can only come in the same sort of way. There can be no question of tabulating successes and failures and trying to decide whether the successes are too numerous to be accounted for by chance. Those who best know a man best know whether, when he did what they asked, he did it because they asked. I think those who best know God will best know whether he sent me to the barber's shop because the barber prayed. For up till now we have been tackling the whole question in the wrong way and on the wrong level. The very question, does prayer work, puts us in the wrong frame of mind from the outset. Work. As if it were magic or a machine, something that functions automatically. 
Prayer is either a sheer illusion or a personal contact between embryonic, incomplete persons, ourselves, and the utterly concrete person. Prayer, in the sense of petition, asking for things, is a small part of it. Confession and penitence are its threshold, adoration its sanctuary, the presence and vision and enjoyment of God its bread and wine. In it God shows himself to us. That he answers prayers is a corollary, not necessarily the most important one, from that revelation. What he does is learned from what he is. Petitionary prayer is, nonetheless, both allowed and commanded to us. Give us our daily bread, and no doubt it raises a theoretical problem. Can we believe that God ever really modifies his action in response to the suggestions of men? For infinite wisdom does not need telling what is best, and infinite goodness needs no urging to do it. But neither does God need any of those things that are done by finite agents, whether living or inanimate. He could, if he chose, repair our bodies miraculously without food, or give us food without the aid of farmers, bakers and butchers, or knowledge without the aid of learned men, or convert the heathen without missionaries. Instead, he allows soils and weather and animals and the muscles, minds and wills of men to cooperate in the execution of his will. God, said Pascal, instituted prayer in order to lend to his creatures the dignity of causality, but not only prayer. Whenever we act at all, he lends us that dignity. It is not really stranger nor less strange that my prayers should affect the course of events than that my other actions should do so. They have not advised or changed God's mind, that is, his overall purpose, but that purpose will be realized in different ways according to the actions, including the prayers, of his creatures. For he seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly and in the twinkling of an eye. He allows us to neglect what he would have us do or to fail. Perhaps we do not fully realize the problem, so to call it, of enabling finite free wills to coexist with omnipotence. It seems to involve at every moment almost a sort of divine abdication. We are not mere recipients or spectators. We are either privileged to share in the game or compelled to collaborate in the work, to wield our little tridents. Is this amazing process simply creation going on before our eyes? This is how, no light matter, God makes something, indeed makes gods, out of nothing. So at least it seems to me. But what I have offered can be, at the very best, only a mental model or symbol. All that we say on such subjects must be merely analogical and parabolic. The reality is doubtless not comprehensible by our faculties, but we can at any rate try to expel bad analogies and bad parables. Prayer is not a machine. It is not magic. It is not advice offered to God. Our act when we pray must not, any more than all our other acts, be separated from the continuous act of God himself, in which alone all finite causes operate. It would be even worse to think of those who get what they pray for, as a sort of court favourites, people who have influence with the throne. The refused prayer of Christ in Gethsemane is answer enough to that. And I dare not leave out the hard saying which I once heard from an experienced Christian. I have seen many striking answers to prayer, and more than one that I thought miraculous, but they usually come at the beginning, before conversion, or soon after it. As the Christian life proceeds, they tend to be rarer. The refusals, too, are not only more frequent, they become more unmistakable more emphatic. Does God then forsake just those who serve him best? Well, 
he who served him best of all, said, near his tortured death, why hast thou forsaken me? When God becomes man, that man, of all others, is least comforted by God at his greatest need, there is a mystery here which, even if I had the power, I might not have the courage to explore. Meanwhile, little people like you and me, if our prayers are sometimes granted, beyond all hope and probability, had better not draw hasty conclusions to our own advantage. If we were stronger, we might be less tenderly treated. If we were braver, we might be sent with far less help to defend far more desperate posts in the great battle.